Hello again. It is one of the few things that we all know about the history of flight, that the Wright brothers were the first to take to the sky in a heavier than air flying machine. They achieved this feat in 1903, a couple of years after the death of Queen Victoria. Aeroplanes were unknown before the 20th century. This knowledge makes the appearance of powered flight in steampunk narratives set in the 19th century pleasingly anachronistic. When we read a description of steam-powered aeroplanes, we know at once we are firmly and definitely in the realm of fantasy. Except, of course, that is not really the case, and the truth is that a steam-powered aeroplane left the ground in England in the 1890s. It was constructed by Hiram Maxey, the American inventor, nor was it the only steam plane of its kind at the time. Before we look at the idea of actual steam-powered aircraft in the 19th century, let's return to the question of the Wright brothers and their famous flight in 1903. What did they actually achieve and for what are we remembering them? Not the first manned flight, of course. That took place in France in 1783, when various people ascended in hot air balloons. The first heavier-than-air flight? Well, that honour goes to a 10-year-old boy who, in 1849, flew in a primitive glider devised by Englishman George Cayley. A few years later, an adult flew in another of Cayley's gliders, this time one with controls which the pilot operated in order to manoeuvre the aircraft in flight. Was it perhaps powered flight that the Wrights first demonstrated? Not even that. For as early as 1853, Frenchman Henri Giffard used a steam engine to propel a dirigible through the air above Paris. Powered heavier than air flight? The Wright brothers were beaten to that goal too by others, including a Frenchman and a fellow American. Let's just stop for a moment and consider that the Wright's, Wright brothers' place in history is ensured by a secret document which discourages any investigation into their claim to have piloted the world's first aeroplane, and that the facts were a good deal more complicated than most of us realise. There may be controversy about the first successful aeroplane flight, but there is none at all about the world's first airline company. In 1843, just five years after Victoria came to the throne, the Aerial Transit Company was incorporated in London. According to publicity material distributed by the new company, the object was to build aerial steam carriages which would convey passengers, troops and government dispatches to China and India. The thumbnail to this video shows one of the aeroplanes which would make this ambitious project a practical proposition. Throwing out smoke like an airborne railway engine, the airliner sails over the heads of admiring crowds. It very much represented the spirit of the times. It was only a few years since the first fare-paying passengers had been transported by a railway train, and the railway mania was in full flow. If steam engines could carry people across the sea and from city to city, why not into the sky as well? The very idea of a steam plane today seems so patently absurd that we smile involuntarily at the thought. Who could imagine such a thing outside the pages of a fantasy? In fact, plenty of people not only imagined steam aeroplanes, they also built them. And while it is perfectly true that some were ludicrously unsuited to fly, others did indeed leave the ground quite literally under their own steam. Nobody who studies the matter for more than an hour or two doubts for a moment that the first heavier-than-air flying machines were powered not by primitive internal combustion engines, but rather by sophisticated steam engines which have been many years in development. The real mystery is why this is not more generally known. In 1881, Hiram Maxim came to England to organise the London offices of the United States Electric Lighting Company. He fell in love with the country and his visits home became more and more infrequent until he decided to stay in England for good and acquired British nationality. Once he was settled on an estate near Bexley in Kent, 
Maxime decided to devote himself to the problem of powered, heavier-than-air flying machines. If anybody could solve the difficulties which this entailed, the famous inventor was surely the man to do it. Maxime had long had an interest in powered, heavier-than-air flight. His father had designed, although never built, a helicopter with twin rotors. When the Wright brothers began their experiments with gliders and powered aeroplanes at the beginning of the 20th century, they were careful to keep weight down to an absolute minimum, building their planes from spruce wood and fabric. This was not Hiram Maxim's way. From the late 1880s onwards, he constructed increasingly large aircraft, which he called test rigs. Describing them as large understates the case dramatically. They were the size of modern airliners. The one which was finally tested successfully in 1894 had a wingspan of 125 feet and weighed three and a half tons. The Wright's flyer, by comparison, weighed less than a tenth of this. The propellers on Maxim's test rig were over 17 feet long and the whole structure was built of steel tubing with no consideration at all for keeping the thing light. It was powered by two enormous steam engines, each capable of providing 180 horsepower. The total lifting area of the rings was around 4,000 square feet. The whole aim of Maxime's project was not actually for his test rig to take to the air in free flight. He simply wished to prove that his theories were correct and that with sufficient power and a large enough area of cambered wing service that it was possible to lift such a, li lift such a large structure from the ground. The test rig ran along a broad gauge railway track and arrangements had been made so it could not rise more than a few inches, however successful the aerodynamic design should prove. Wooden guide rails ran alongside the railway track and these were intended to keep the test rig tethered to the ground when moving. Outriggers had small wheels which would engage the guide rails if the test rig should rise from the main rails. This would prevent the machine from flying up into the air. After years of experimentation, both with uh, large test rigs and also a specially constructed wind tunnel, the day arrived when the inventor was ready to show the public what his machine could do. Newspapers and magazines such as The Times and Scientific America were invited to attend the demonstration, as well as many important people, including the Prince of Wales, who later became King Edward VII, and also the author H.G. Wells. This was fortunate because the presence of so many eyewitnesses ensured that there is not the slightest doubt about what happened on that summer day in 1894. Tuesday the 31st of July 1894 dawned bright and clear. After a couple of slow runs along the 1800 foot track, just to check that everything was running smoothly, the time came for the test of the machine's full capabilities. The engines were turned on to full power and the great Leviathan shot off along the railway track at 40 miles an hour. On board were Hiram and Maxim and two mechanics, Tom Jackson and Arthur Guthrie. As has been remarked before, weight was not a consideration in the way it was with the Wright brothers' test flights. Perhaps Maxim's own account of that memorable day is the best and most accurate. It was, remember, backed up by many witnesses, including cynical journalists who had been only too happy to report a miserable flop and the failure of the famous inventor's enterprise. Maxime wrote, When everything was ready, with careful observers stationed on each side of the track, the order was given to let go. The enormous screw thrust started the machine so quickly that it almost threw the engineers off their feet, and the machine bounded over the track at a great rate. Maxim went on to explain how he had increased the power from the steam engines and that the speed rapidly increased. He continued, when 900 feet had been covered, one of the rear axle trees, which were of two-inch steel tubing, doubled up and sent the rear of the machine completely free. The pencils ran completely across the cylinders of the dynagraphs and caught on the underneath end. The rear end of the machine being set free raised considerably above the track and swayed. The other restrained wheels tore through the guide rails and the test rig rose into the air, travelling in this way at a height of between six and eight feet for a distance of several hundred feet. When Maxime and the mechanics realised that they were actually airborne, 
They at once closed down the power when the test rig sank back to the ground. There are two curious points about the first Navy flight of Clara and Maxime's colossal biplane. The first is that although both the Times and Scientific American reported it in detail and described it as the first successful flight of a heavier-than-air flying machine, it has been lost to history. Supplanted in the minds of most people by the Wright brothers' feeble efforts almost a decade later. We shall see later why this might have been. The second point is that the presence of H.G. Wells at the flight tied in neatly with uh, various other technological developments in the 19th century that he exploited in his novels. Works such as The War in the Air, written in 1907, and containing vivid accounts of battles between aerial armadas, was more likely to have been influenced by Wells witnessing the gigantic flying machines of Hara and Maxine taking to the air than by newspaper reports of the flimsy machines knocked up by the Wright brothers. It is suspected that many viewers will by now be asking themselves why they have been convinced since childhood that the Wright brothers were the first to build and fly a heavier-than-air flying machine when there were so many people like Hiram Maxim that had already uh, achieved this feat. To understand how history has been so grossly distorted, we need to look at another steam-powered aeroplane, the first heavier-than-air flying machine to achieve sustained power flight. At about the same time that Hiram Maxim was experimenting with steam planes in England, the Secretary of the Smithsonian Institute, America's most prestigious group of museums, was doing much the same thing in the United States. Samuel Pierpont Langley was a mathematician and astronomer and also a firm believer in the future of powered flight. Langley, who turned 60 in the year of Maxime's successful flight, designed an aeroplane and commissioned engineers to build a quarter-scale model of it with a wingspan of 14 feet. He christened this aerodrome and several versions were built, each more efficient than the last. The twin screws were driven by a steam engine. In 1896, two of Langley's aeroplanes were tested. They achieved stable and controlled flight over a distance of 4,200 feet, an amazing achievement. Alexander Graham Bell was present at one flight and took a photograph of aerodrome number six soaring over the Potomac River. Two years later, Langley was given a government grant of £50,000 to build a full-sized version of the aerodrome, one capable of carrying a person. The test of the larger version of Langley's plane, which took place in 1903, was not successful. Each one ended in the aeroplane crashing straight into the Potomac on takeoff. That same year, the Wright brothers carried out their first flight to the flyer. Before going any further, we might consider that the Wright brothers' claim to fame is quite tenuous and elusive. Others before them had flown heavier-than-air flying machines, both powered and unpowered. Some had made powered flights of roughly comparable length to those the Wright brothers made in December 1903. It's not always appreciated that the Wright brothers had chosen that spot and time of year for their flights because of the gale force winds which howled along the beach there in the winter. In 1902, they had launched gliders, which stayed aloft for longer than the flyer, powered by nothing more than the fierce winds. The flyer, which was essentially a glider fitted with a small petrol engine, might very well have been able to take to the air even well without the assistance of the petrol-driven propeller. The Wright brothers entered the history books having undertaken the first man-powered, sustained and controlled heavier-than-air flight. This is a little misleading, though, because their flights in 1903 were all in a straight line, just as was Hiram Maxim's in 1894. He too had controls, although he, like the Wright brothers, didn't really have a chance to use them because the flight was so short. The Wright brothers were certainly important pioneers of flight, but their claim to have built and flown the world's first aeroplane was, at least in the first few decades of the 20th century, a little shaken. The Smithsonian, while keen to display the flyer in their museum, also championed Samuel Langley as the first man to build a successful aeroplane on the grounds that his earlier quarter-scale models flew and that his full-sized version was actually capable of carrying a person. Langley was, after all, 
at one time secretary of the Smithsonian and they clearly wished to give him a boost. They displayed Langley's aeroplane in the museum with a sign declaring that it was the first airplane capable of flight. In 1918, Orville White, his brother Wilbur was by this time dead, took great exception to this and fell out with the Smithsonian. His irritation took the most practical form of removing the flyer from the Smithsonian, where it was a valued exhibit, and having it shipped across the Atlantic to the Science Museum in London, where it was to remain for 20 years. The Smithsonian was so desperately keen to have the flyer back that in 1948 they were prepared to sign an extraordinary and legally binding contract which Orville Wright presented to them. Wright died in January 1948 before negotiations had been completed, but his executors duly presented to the Smithsonian the contract which he had drawn up. So keen were the museum to get the flyer back that they were prepared to agree to what was, in effect, a promise never to investigate the history of aviation. One passage read as follows. <clears throat> Neither the Smithsonian Institution or its successors, nor any other agency, bureau or facilities administered for the United States of America by the Smithsonian Institute or its successors, shall publish or permit to be displayed a statement or label in connection with or in respect of any aircraft model or design of earlier date than the Wright aeroplane of 1903, claiming in effect that such aircraft was capable of carrying a man under its own power in controlled flight. For over 70 years, the Smithsonian, administered by the United States government, has been obliged to ignore any evidence of powered flight which predates that of the Wright brothers. This accounts, at least in part, for the fact that steam planes have been obscured from sight over the years and the flyer promoted as the only contender for the honour. This secret agreement has had a chilling effect upon the Smithsonian Institution's readiness to examine objectively the history of man flight. I dare say that some viewers will assume that this must have been nonsense. In the description to this video, I give a link to a bit on the subject. As the Scientific American remarked in the edition of September the 15th, 1894, on Tuesday, July the 31st, for the first time in the history of the world, a flying machine actually left the ground fully equipped with engines, boiler, fuel, water and a crew of three persons. The Wright brothers really were not the first, not by a long chalk. 